Uh, so first of all, thank you all for uh, being here today. Really, really appreciate your attendance on these webinars um, and very exciting that today, uh, due to the Academy Assembly that is going on here at the United States Air Force Academy, we actually have an opportunity to give this webinar live and in person uh, right with our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Cheng right here. Uh, and so because Mr. Cheng is live and in person, uh, what I will do is I will abbreviate uh, my normal opening remarks and uh, kind of introductory uh, matters and allow Mr. Cheng to introduce himself. Uh, we have a very exciting program today, and so I will turn it over to Mr. Cheng, uh, and then we will hopefully have about right 20 minutes or possibly even a little bit more uh, for questions. And Mr. Cheng has indicated that right if we go a little bit long, that's okay. So please prepare your questions, right, as Mr. Uh, Cheng is speaking, uh, and we will be ready to answer those questions at the conclusion of his main presentation. Thank you, and uh, Mr. Cheng, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's uh, quite an honor, um, especially to be the first in person, apparently, in a while. Um, let's see, my name is Dean Cheng. Uh, up until very recently, I was the Senior Research Fellow for Chinese Political and Security Affairs at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, I retired uh, at the end of September. Um, although my wife tells me that uh, this is a, a good example of why I'm failing retirement badly. Uh, my comments today are going to be about uh, Chinese views on legal warfare and space. Um, so as uh, I'm sure uh, most, if not all of you are well aware, China is a space power. China has a full portfolio of space capabilities. Um, so I'm going to lead off with more of a conversation, uh, discussion about Chinese views of legal warfare, because legal warfare uh, occupies an important place in a broader set of contexts relating to the PRC. Uh, let me begin, though, by noting that the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military, is a party army. It is not a national army military. And that's very important. It is the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party, of course, just had a 20th Party Congress. Xi Jinping has go, uh, got another five years as head of the party at this Congress. Um, and the PLA uh, uh, saw a new Central Military Commission, that's the um, organizational leadership at the highest level, which saw the elevation, among other things, of uh, people associated with the Equipment Development Department, which has responsibility for developing space capabilities, uh, as well as um, the uh, continued presence of a former deputy commander of the PLA Strategic Support Force, which is responsible for space operations, electronic warfare operations, network warfare operations, which includes cyber, and interestingly, took over one of the departments for, what the, uh, for political warfare. Uh, political warfare um, for the PLA uh, is partly the responsibility of the political work department. Uh, one of the four general, uh, one of the key general departments of the People's Liberation Army. The political work department uh, produces political officers, political commissars, ensures everyone is politically uh, reliable. Um, if you are in a Western military in this audience, you have, especially if you're in the United States, you sign, you signed and made an oath to uphold, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And um, for our foreign partners, presumably to the equivalent in your nation. The People's Liberation Army, as a party army, is first and foremost loyal to the Chinese Communist Party. The political work department ensures that loyalty. Um, among the responsibilities, in addition to ensuring political reliability, is the conduct of what the Chinese term political warfare. And this was codified in both the 2003 and 2010 political work regulations of the PLA. There's been a more recent set, but interestingly, these are much harder to get copies of because the Chinese have started clamping down on essentially all of their documentation. Political warfare needs to be put in a context. And in this particular case, the context is strategic anti-access and aerial denial. By the way, that's a Western term. The Chinese term is counter-intervention. When I say strategic, what this means is that not nuclear so much as a geostrategic political strategy effort to delegitimize outside intervention, especially the United States, to call into question American alliances, 
American partners, to raise doubts in both those partners and in third parties about whether or not American intervention is justified, whether American intervention is uh, being carried out in accordance with the laws of armed conflict, proportional, um, et cetera. And so by undermining and undercutting the very foundations, the justifications for intervention, you create the opportunity then for the PRC to counter. If you break the laws of armed conflict, we presumably then can do so as well. War to start pulling away allies, potentially key operating areas, key capabilities, including in space and cyber. Um, so what are the three warfares? I've mentioned that several times. These are an essential element for the Chinese military of obtaining um, information dominance. It is aimed at foreign and domestic audiences. Uh, domestic, because a key battleground from the Chinese perspective in the waging of information warfare is their own audience, maintaining political support. Wars end above all when one's own side says this war is not worth it. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of that in Russia. We are not seeing that in Ukraine. We see a fully mobilized population. That makes it harder to conquer the other side. Um, so it is, in a sense, the modern version of winning without fighting, or at least minimizing the fight. Political warfare is, above all, about undermining an opponent's will, an opponent's support for a conflict, while strengthening your own. And the core of political warfare are, for today, legal warfare, public opinion warfare, and psychological warfare. And I'll focus most of my comments next on legal warfare, but I will try to explain the other two. Legal warfare, fa lu is the effort to portray one's own side as acting legally and the adversary as acting illegally. It employs all aspects of law and legal institutions, international law, treaties, national laws, regulations, law enforcement agencies. Um, Interpol has been a key part of Chinese efforts in day-to-day -day legal warfare. By the way, none of these have to occur during wartime, they just get redoubled in wartime. So for example, we see the Chinese using Interpol to harass human rights uh, figures around the world uh, when they criticize China about the Uyghurs or Xinjiang by issuing red notices through Interpol asking that people be detained or in some cases even be extradited to the PRC. <clears throat> we also see in the South China Sea the use of the Chinese Coast Guard. Why the Chinese Coast Guard? Because from the Chinese perspective, the South China Sea is Chinese territory. You would no more send the, it, it makes perfect sense to send the Chinese Coast Guard, a law enforcement agency then, to uphold Chinese claims in the South China Sea. Um, it does not make sense to send the military, just like despite crime problems in, say, Chicago, you don't see the 82nd Airborne being sent in. You see police. You may see more FBI, but you don't send the military down <clears throat> into the loop, uh, even if there is bad crime. This is a political messaging effort by the Chinese, by using the Chinese Coast Guard to say, of course we're using the Coast Guard. This is our territory. It's not under discussion as being rivaled or disputed territory. Um, one of the key things to keep in mind about legal warfare from the Chinese perspective is that this is not, I want to emphasize, not about what is actually legal. It is not about going before a court and arguing before the law, one side and the other, and seeking some kind of adjudication. It is an effort to portray the other side as illegal. It is an effort to obtain strategic success, political gains, through the use of all of these instruments of the law. <clears throat> it supports and is supported by public opinion warfare and psychological warfare. And it's important here to recognize that from the Chinese perspective, the law, especially when applied in legal warfare, is an instrumentality. That is, I know what I want to achieve. I will use the law to achieve it. It's not about what is legal. It is about using that And that is consistent with the Chinese broader approach because theirs is a rule by law society, not a rule of law society. Dating long before the People's Republic of China, Imperial China developed rules, systems of law, but those laws were never used to constrain the authority of the emperor 
or the emperor's agents. And in fact, Chinese magistrates in the imperial era were a prosecutor and judge. Um, instead, they the law existed because the emperor and the imperial structure needed a reason for saying what you were doing was wrong, um, while not limiting necessarily their own activities. So some examples of legal war of uh, um, the doctrinal employment of legal warfare is uh, offensively speaking, to seize the initiative, com to compel the other side, for example, to react. So one of the key things here in the Chinese military writings on legal warfare say this, is that it is even before the guns fire and the horses move, legal warfare is already in place because alongside public opinion warfare and psychological warfare, getting people to believe that China is correct and then changing their mind as we would be trying to do is much harder than if we got in first and said the Chinese are in the wrong. And now China has to act to try and countervail and rebut that. Um, and so Chinese uh, offensive legal warfare would be aimed at US, US allied and third parties to erode those alliances. Defensive warfare is used to bolster PRC justifications. An interesting example of this would be the 2005 anti-secession law. And the Chinese have used that anti-secession law in their dealings with Taiwan to say, you know, if you're not negotiating with us to reunify, then in that case, you are in violation of the anti-secession law, leaving us with no choice but to use force, if necessary, to bring you to that table. We have a law that leaves us no choice. They, the Chinese in turn, view our Taiwan Relations Act, which says that we must provide Taiwan with the wherewithal to defend itself as an example of legal warfare. We created a law that we now turn to and say, see, we have no choice. We have to sell arms to Taiwan. From the Chinese perspective, that's nonsense. You don't have to. You do so because you passed a law that creates those conditions. So this is a justification by us, from their view, for them, um, but this is legal warfare. Um, public opinion warfare, the second of the three warfares, <clears throat> is constant, it is ongoing, it is aimed globally, and that is aimed at adjusting global perceptions. And really all three of these, at the end of the day, come down to affecting decision makers. Public opinion warfare from the Chinese perspective was scarily effective in 2003 because the United States launched a war against Iraq that had neither UN authorization nor broad international support, certainly not compared with the 1990 conflict, and yet no country aided Iraq. Not Russia, not uh, Iran, not even the People's Republic of China. We, the West, had conducted such effective public opinion warfare that Saddam Hussein was an atheist. And even if the US broke international law, even if the US launched an offensive, aggressive war, no one was going to support Saddam Hussein. And from the Chinese perspective, that's terrifying because if we could do that to Iraq, we could potentially do that to China, which is why they respond so negatively on human rights issues and charges of Chinese cheating and all of the rest. Because to their mind, all of that is public opinion warfare aimed at undermining the PRC. And then finally, psychological warfare, which is aimed at creating the psychological conditions through public opinion warfare and legal warfare of a um, PRC that is very powerful. And we see this, for example, with supply chain arguments. This isn't to say China isn't a part of supply chains, obviously it is, but the idea that we do not want to offend China because they have an outsized role in our supply chains and not vice versa is a great example of psychological warfare where we self-limit and self-constrain because of the psychological aspect of China's being number two in the economy. Now, the irony is that China, what is number two economy in the world and is a key part of multiple supply chains, has its own vulnerabilities, right? And we saw this with ZTE and Huawei with limitations on microchip sales and software sales uh, through the Android store. But we have not really internalized the idea that China can be every bit as vulnerable as we are. By the way, the same is also true for food. China is a net importer of food. But you don't hear very often the discussion of how that makes China vulnerable 
in any Taiwan crisis or situation like that. All we hear about is how vulnerable we are. Um, so uh, with those, with that as a background regarding um, Chinese views of the three warfares and legal warfare, I want to now move on to China's space program very quickly. The Chinese space program, it's important to note, is not like the um, American or Russian space programs. It had very different motivations. Uh, ironically, it was more about symbolism, less about things like missile early warning. In fact, even now, uh, when China has a full-blown space industrial complex, at least according to open source literature, there are no Chinese missile early warning satellites. Uh, a set of capabilities that arguably is, is well within China's technological capacity, given all the various other space systems they have developed. Um, they also have not been part of a space race, and they are not part of one now. We and the Soviets were obviously part of a space race from 1957 through at least 1969 and the first landing on the moon, sending rockets up on a very frequent basis, et cetera. Until the Chinese started their space station, they were happy putting a crude mission up, C-R-E-W, not C-R-U-D, -E, um, about every two years. That is not a race. Um, if they are in a race, they are in a race with other Asian nations. They are not in a race with the United States. Um, China has very much integrated its space capabilities into its broader perspective on what they term comprehensive national power. Comprehensive national power, term developed by the Japanese, basically is how do nations rack and stack? How do you compare? What factors should you compare in order to think about a Brazil, a China, a Japan, an India, United States? And it includes multiple factors, military, economic, political unity, if you're not unified, you really aren't a major international competitor. Diplomatic respect, other countries care what you think. Level of science and technology, even cultural security. From the Chinese perspective, space plays a role in every one of these. Military is self-evident, economic, spin-off, spin-on technologies, uh, fosters innovation, which also goes to science and technology. Um, it creates political unity and a sense of national pride. It also is a signal to places like Taiwan that we are watching you. Uh, diplomatic respect, um, it enhances China's international reputation. Um, when it comes to cultural security, this is something Americans in particular don't tend to think about very much. But there's a reason the Chinese, as they have helped fund movies coming out of Hollywood, have funded, helped fund movies like Gravity. Sandra Bullock doesn't make it back to Earth without getting on board a Senzo spacecraft. The Martian, um, uh, Matt Dillon can do his Iron Man routine because his spacecraft got refueled thanks to Chinese spacecraft. Uh, Independence Day 2, which is, by the way, a terrible movie, um, the, the head of the moon base is a Chinese officer. His niece is one of the squadron of special pilots. Um, so again, the Chinese play a key, if supporting role. Um, and this is then broadcast globally, thanks to Hollywood, in terms of China's role as a space player. So um, because space can play such an important role across a variety of technology areas, the Chinese see space as an important contributor. It is an area that they need to invest in, that they need to develop, and they, they are competing in. Um, in the more specifically military security realm, space dominance is seen as vital to achieving information dominance, which is the key to winning informationized local wars. Informationized local wars is how the Chinese conceive of uh, current and likely future wars. Wars will be fought and will be won or lost in no small part in the information domain. The ability to gather information, to transmit information, to exploit information, to analyze information more rapidly and more accurately than your adversary, and preventing them from doing the same is how you fight and win informationized local war. And space, because that is a key part of how we fight, is going to be a major battleground in space. Now, that's a very asymmetric situation because for the United States, our wars are away games. <coughs> and 
we certainly want to keep it that way. Um, our wars are going to be in the Western Pacific. Uh, they are going to be in the Middle East. Uh, God help us, they will be in along the Black Sea. Um, what they aren't fought is in the Gulf of Mexico. What that means is that we have to have space to coordinate carrier battle groups and strike groups, air expeditionary units, uh, army forces on the ground, marine uh, expeditionary units. Um, for China, all of their likely scenarios are within a couple of hundred miles of the coast. And that means that they have do not have to rely on space. You can rely on UAVs, you can rely on air breathing systems, you can rely on fishing vessels, they have the world's largest fishing fleet. They can rely on commercial merchant shipping, they have the world's largest merchant fleet. They can rely on signals intelligence, they can rely, communications can rely on uh, microwave, on cell phones, on um, fiber optics. Uh, they do not require space to operate in the South China Sea, um, around Taiwan, along the Sino-Indian border. So, in their context, then space dominance is about space denial to the United States or any other advanced adversary, more so than being able to exploit space. That is potentially going to change over the coming decades, but certainly for the next five years or so, so long as Taiwan is the key pacing challenge for the PLA, space is less important. Now, in that strategic context of information dominance and wartime context, there is also the role of commercial players, in no small part because we rely on commercial communication satellites, not only to talk to each other, but also to operate our UAVs, the data relays and things that allow UAVs to operate from nice sites in Nevada, controlled from Nevada, but operating around the world could only occur because we have satellite communications. And if you eliminate the satellites, or at least the utility of the satellites, you really do start affecting the ability of our forces to operate in the manner to which we are accustomed, including the ability to coordinate forces and operate unmanned vehicles. The Chinese produce space white paper every five years. Uh, this is a key to their five-year plans. Their most recent space white paper gives us some indication of where they are likely to be heading in space. Uh, notably, if you take a look at all the space white papers, China has no military space program. Uh, there's never any mention of a military space program. Um, but uh, what do we see? We see uh, a new space transportation system. They're going to be developing new rockets, expanded space infrastructure, satellite uh, like data relay systems, uh, new tracking telemetry and control systems. Uh, we're going to see um, new uh, position navigation and timing satellites. And that's very striking because the Chinese only recently completed the Beidou system to, into a global network. And by the way, Beidou also has a backup communications capacity, 140 characters. Now, you would think that sounds like perfect for tweeting, but 140 Chinese characters is a very um, data dense. It's about half a page in English, uh, can be. So 140 characters transmitted through the PNT system could download interesting instructions, could allow a certain degree of communications. Relative, relevant to the issue of legal warfare is the emphasis on new space governance initiatives. The Chinese in their space white paper say that in the next five years, things they want to do are develop, is to develop a space traffic control network, a debris monitoring system, and a new set of rules regarding how nations will operate in space. Part of this being justified on the argument of we, China, are going to have our own space station fully operational. The last pieces are currently uh, being installed. We expect to develop facilities on the moon, unmanned in this five-year plan through 2025, potentially manned in the next one, ranging out to 2030, um, and more cislunar traffic as China deploys more unmanned vehicles out to the moon, including to the far side of the moon, which is laid out in the uh, 2020, uh, in this space white paper. So within that context, then, we should expect to see China being much more active at both the governmental uh, law setting uh, space governance aspect, but also industrial standards which they see as an issue of governance. And that too 
is something that they openly say they want to be part of. Uh, you can find some details on this under um, uh, China Standards 2035, a broader uh, effort to make sure that China is part of international standard setting uh, bodies across industries, not just space. Uh, that seeks to see China be a major player in the setting of industrial standards by 2035. Let me conclude with a couple of potential opportunities for legal warfare from Beijing's perspective. First, China is a regular player in the UN Conference on Disarmaments, Paris, Prevention on Arms Races in Outer Space. The Chinese and the Russians have tabled repeatedly um, proposals that would basically ban the militarization of space. Um, Interestingly, if you look at the uh, proposals, the Chinese ASAT test from 2007, the Russian ASAT test from a couple of years ago, neither of those would have been banned because they were fired from the ground. And so that wouldn't fall under the Chinese proposal for Paris. Uh, when you talk to the Chinese um, and ask them about militarization, by the way, it's a very interesting term. Militarization, because they have repeatedly said, we have not militarized the South China Sea. Now, uh, we have pictures of the Chinese islands they built in the South China Sea with weapons on them. How is this not militarization? And Chinese military officers will tell you, those are defensive weapons. When we use the term militarization, we mean offense. And it's like, so American activities in space, those are offense, they'll be out. Well, if we accept that Chinese definition, of course, and from the Chinese perspective, there's nothing wrong with having one set of definitions for you, one set of definitions for me, rule by law, rule of law. Um, their systems are defensive. Your systems are offensive. We wish to ban offensive weapons in space. It's rather one-sided. There's no embarrassment there. They view that as perfectly okay. Um, another aspect. RPO policies, rendezvous and proximity operations and keep out zones. This is something we've talked about in the US a fair bit as service satellites come out. How do we have, um, what happens if somebody tries to do a non-consensual uh, RPO? And the idea is you would have keep out zones. Now this creates an interesting challenge, however. Let's say you decide that you want a 20 mile keep out zone for each satellite. Now, does that apply to all satellites? Presumably it does. Would it apply to CubeSats? In theory, it could. So if I have state-owned enterprises producing satellites, big or small, and don't have to worry about a profit motive, could I, in theory, daisy chain a set of satellites at 40 miles apart and thereby not establish sovereignty? We all know sovereignty is not possible under the outer space treaty, but from a health and safety RPO keep out zone perspective, basically create a de facto orbital line chain that is governed by sovereignty. It wouldn't be called that, but it would be linked, right? Um, what if they were CubeSats? So it's not even that expensive. This is something that I would suggest the Chinese are thinking about because we do see them applying that sort of logic to their approach to EEZs, exclusive economic zones, in the South China Sea. Um, another one is going to be the issue of rules of the road more broadly, um, registration of uh, space bodies, um, who is allowed and not allowed to operate near each other. Um, another area of uh, space governance is going to be that of commercial entities. Beijing has been very clear that they are uncomfortable with what space uh, Starlink has done in Ukraine. They have repeatedly said that they would like the US to explain exactly what the legal uh, governance, legal sort of position of a company is when it engages in activities that arguably cross the laws of armed conflict. Does the United States believe that it is going to defend such entities? And by the way, obviously it, it goes beyond Starlink, right? If Intel sats communication satellites are, their transponders are part of what is operating a predator squadron, your answer to Starlink may well affect Intel sat as well and vice versa. Um, and that is something to think about. Let me close with um, a hypothetical 
which I'm pretty sure is is okay in the legal realm. Um, going back to legal warfare and commercial entities. Commercial entities in the United States have to operate under SEC regulations, which means that corporate boards have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the corporate assets are always, are not jeopardized. So what would happen if in the run-up to a war during a crisis, the PRC were to say that any satellite company providing assistance to the U.S. Armed Forces, war Taiwan, would be considered a hostile actor. And if a shareholder, a group of shareholders, were to then file for an injunction in the American court system, not out of pacifism or war is bad, but under SEC regulations saying the corporate board's actions are going to jeopardize the billions of dollars of assets and therefore would be financially irresponsible. Now remember, this is during crisis. There's no declaration of war, which often provides a way out. And also the US hasn't issued a declaration of war since 1941, which raises the other question, which is does an authorization for the use of military force such as we have had in our various Middle East operations, does that provide the same legal and liability exemptions that a declaration of war, force majeure, military majeure state, et cetera, allows? And I would suggest that that is unknown at this point. It would be a good idea for corporate legal counsel, JAGS, the perhaps Department of Justice, probably the Department of Commerce, the SEC and others to sit down and hammer that out. And by the way, hammer that out, not only for US companies, but also perhaps our foreign partners and in conjunction with our foreign partners um, before we are the subject of legal warfare along these lines. Because I would suggest to you that because Beijing has such an expansive view of what legal warfare means, because it employs all aspects of the law. And by the way, that includes law review articles, which play an important role from the Chinese perspective of creating legal arguments that they will then trot out in court and so there are lots of Chinese legal journals, and I hope there are people out there who read Chinese and are lawyers who are reading those things, um, because they will be trotting out articles and asking why is a article, a law review article from a Chinese law school any less valid than Harvard Law or Northwestern uh, Law School, uh, et cetera? Why is it any less valid as an argument? Um, they will be doing this across a range of laws, across a range of regulations, all of which are not aimed, in this case, for example, at stopping, but at delay. Imagine 72 hours without satellite support for your UAV operations. That is the kind of approach that you, as military lawyers, as JAGs, et cetera, but also as corporate counsels are likely to confront in the event of a future conflict. Let me stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Well, sir, thank you so much for that presentation. Really, really appreciate it. I will turn to the Q&A chat. Um, go ahead, and if anyone does have any questions, please go ahead and throw those into either the Q&A or the chat box. Uh, and until we get some there in the chat box, sir, uh, I will go ahead and uh, ask you some questions as well. So we've heard a little bit about right Starlink in Ukraine uh, and you and I were having a conversation right before the webinar started right about this very issue and Chinese interest in potentially targeting Starlink um, might want to get to that later but the question that I have for you is slightly different obviously in the lead up to the invasion of Ukraine there was a very widespread perception that Russia was going to roll the Ukrainians, right? That it was going to be over in maybe a week or less, yeah. and that that was going to be the end. Obviously, not the case. So there was a perception of the relative strength of the Russian military, including uh, its capabilities in the cyber realm, in the space domain, etc., that proved to some degree to be false, right? Because Ukraine is still in the fight, and really, in fact, it seems like the tide has to some degree turned against the Russians. What is your perspective of uh, the relative strength of the Chinese military in this regard? We obviously, like you've said, we've convinced ourselves, we, maybe the United States, certainly Western nations, that um, the Chinese military is exceptionally powerful, has these exceptional capabilities in cyber and space as well. 
Uh, do you believe that this is simply a paper tiger, perhaps like the Russian military turned out to be, uh, or is there true cause for concern in that regard? So let me start with a couple of caveats about the Russians. Uh, and well, the biggest caveat is I'm not a Russian expert. So let me start off with that very upfront. Um, but what I would say is that I think that we were very badly mistaken about Russian Air Force capabilities. It does seem like the Russian Air Force has definitely underperformed relative to what we'd expected. It's less clear the extent to which they underperformed on cyber versus they have chosen not to perform. And what I mean by that is, it is unclear, certainly from an unclassified open source basis, to know whether Russia tried to launch a lot of cyber attacks and was frustrated and defeated, or had they held back on those capabilities. Cyber is funny. Um, as, as I think uh, one analyst recently observed, cyber is not an artillery barrage. You can't sort of, Hollywood I think has ruined us. Uh, Hollywood has this idea of, we need to hack into their computer networks. And next thing you know, Jeff Goldblum is hacking into an alien computer network thanks to his all-powerful Apple. Um, the reality is that cyber is much, you know, if we look at what happened with Stuxnet, that was years in the making. Lots of things had to be overcome. Mm -hmm. And even there, things kind of didn't always go according to what we think was intended. So I'm not saying that the Russians hadn't penetrated Ukraine, but the ability to immediately call down effects raises is, is really not possible, which means you burn your weapon. Unlike a javelin or a stinger, it's gone. You will not be able to reuse that probably ever. Um, so do you want to use that in a conflict against you? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. With regards to China, I think, so with, with its cyber capabilities, what we see is a very different range of things that the Chinese cyber hackers have gone after. Um, they don't seem to have gone after Facebook. They don't seem to have tried to create uh, bot armies to influence elections as much. They seem to have gone after corporate uh, accounts and things, uh, as well as obviously security and, and uh, traditional espionage. So I don't know that we have a good sense of how their cyber will operate. With regards to the broader, more traditional militaries, we don't know because they haven't fought a war since 1979. We thought the Russians would do better because we've seen them in Syria, we've seen them in Georgia, we've seen them in Chechnya, and they did badly initially and learned. Um, I think that the Chinese military has a lot of weaknesses that the PLA is aware of. Um, they are only now fully mechanized. They have a lot of information technology, which has never really had to operate, not just in wartime, but even necessarily um, in mutwa, military operations, other than war. We have activities in Syria. We have activities elsewhere. The Chinese don't even have that really uh, as something to go by. Their logistics is untried, and that's huge. Um, you know, experts talk about logistics. How well will their logistics uh, operate? And as we were talking about, this is a military of single choice. This is therefore a military that is going to be adver at, uh, averse to suffering huge casualties. It's also a military that has openly written that these are spoiled uh, brats and often physically unqualified to serve in the military. Sounds familiar, I'm yeah, sure, to some of our own recruiting commands. No, because they say these kids have been spoiled by four grandparents and two parents. They are overweight. They are not used to physical uh, hardship. You know, they are not used to spending you know, 12, 14 hours in the field. They complain about spending eight hours in the field, in the rain, in the mud. Um, you know, when my day, the, you know, I remember when I was in boot camp, right. um, but that's what you're seeing in Chinese writings. And let me just conclude with this. Two Chinese peacekeepers lost their lives in South Sudan. And the Chinese social media went crazy over that because they were asking why did these soldiers die in a faraway country? For what? That wasn't defending China. And so they understand that, you know, in a, some things will overcome even censorship, even a pervasive surveillance state. Loss of your child is one of them. 
and wondering whether my child will be next is another one. And so there are a lot of things sort of bubbling under the surface that leave the PLA. This is not a PLA that can simply say, well, we'll chuck a million lives, and if that doesn't work, we'll chuck another million, and eventually we'll win. They understand that if you destroy the party support back that public opinion warfare piece, you lose. Well, sorry, Sue, that there are questions flowing into the chat. Uh, looks like two from uh, Major Aaron Grinaldson, a uh, student uh, currently at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Uh, first question from uh, Major Grinaldson is, is the Space Council and the Users Advisory Group positioned to address questions on commercial satellite use in armed conflicts? And follow up, are there enough non-commercial participants in the Users Advisory Group? Uh, so the user advisory group right now is um, going through a bit of a shift. Um, so uh, we are, uh, we haven't met in a little bit. Um, I believe the vice president and the president have had a few other things on their mind. Um, so, uh, but uh, some of the issues we did talk about were how to reconcile national security needs and commercial needs. Are there enough non-commercial participants? Um, I think that they probably would benefit from having uh, a few more. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, one of the funny things is that uh, you have the military, you have NASA and NOAA, both of whom are, are present. Um, but commercial probably has a better understanding of what commercial brings to the table than anybody else. And our space system is heavily reliant on commercial both for service providers. And that's one of the areas where I do think we actually need more commercial is not launch services, but other service providers. Because I think that that is changing the shape of what commercial, what it means to be a commercial space player. Beyond space launch, I mean, if you think about all the entities that exploit GPS, if you think about all of the ways that um, you have new players who are going to provide SIGINT, who provide Earth observation, who may be part of the exploitation of lunar resources, or will play a role in space traffic management. Um, I think that those probably need to be better represented. And then, sir, follow-up question uh, from Major Brynaldson. Um, and I believe that this was just reported either yesterday or possibly even this morning. Um, so any thoughts on recent news reports that the Chinese have been conducting exercises on the potential use of nuclear weapons to disable satellites in Leo, right? Very much like the Starfish Prime, uh, right, kind of nuclear tests yeah. that the U.S. was conducting way back in the 60s. Uh, any thoughts on that? I think that the Chinese very clearly are thinking about EMP, not necessarily only nuclear generated, but nuclear generated is the easiest. Um, I think that we should be thinking about the hardening of our satellite systems, as well as whether they are hardening theirs. I'm not convinced that the Chinese will use a nuclear generated EMP, although what is very worrisome is that in the science of second artillery campaigns, a classified Chinese document, not classified by us, so I can talk about this publicly, uh, they talk about EMP as part of the deterrence ladder, which looks a lot like our escalation ladder, meaning that this is something they would think about before going to actual ground or air burst of nuclear weapons would be demonstration shots, et cetera, and demonstration shots that should also generate military side effects. So I'm not surprised by this. And when you look at the scale of the Chinese nuclear breakout, 300 ICBM silos, five ballistic missile submarines, and new strategic bomber, um, this opens the opportunity for limited nuclear options. And while we think of limited nuclear options as perhaps picking one or two discrete terrestrial targets, I think, again, because the Chinese see space as part of a holistic context, an EMP shot to generate space effects in, you know, with a nuclear warhead is certainly in their conceptual portfolio. And so would you consider this to be one of the reasons perhaps why China has not signed on to the limited test ban treaty, for example? No, I think the Chinese have been very clear. They will not sign treaties that they were not a party to the negotiations. Uh, with the missile technology control regime, for example, the Chinese, after their sales to Pakistan, said, look, we're willing to constrain or limit our sales to other players, but we will never sign the MTCR because we weren't at the table. And 
this goes back to the so-called center of humiliation. You will never force us to obey your rules that we had no say in. And that, again, has distinct implications for much of the current space governance structure. China was part of the Outer Space Treaty, but a lot of these other things are more fuzzy in terms of whether or not China, you know, China could sign on to New START. No, we weren't there. Why would we sign on to it? So the next question comes from uh, Linda Andruski. Uh, if Bolsonaro wins re-election in Brazil this week, what is your prediction of a unified Latin American space agency and China's influence in such an agency? Uh, with respect to uh, BRICS, Huawei, uh, and will the technology agreement signed by Bolsonaro and Trump be resurrected to expand into indigenous lands to accommodate uh, Elon Musk's launching ability in Brazil? A couple of questions there, sir. Wow. So I'll turn it over uh, to you. Okay. Uh, I'm utterly unqualified to answer your last question uh, there, but um, let me know. China and Brazil have a very long-standing uh, space relationship. Uh, the um, Sibers, Sibers, sorry, China Brazil Earth Resource Satellite uh, was China's first satellite to have uh, charge coupled device cameras, which allowed them to beam images directly to Earth. Before that, they had to drop film canisters. Uh, the Sibers program is still ongoing, um, and there have been jointly produced satellites between China and Brazil. Um, so. Uh, Unfortunately, because of the way China negotiates its agreements, um, they may be ruled by law, but that doesn't mean the lawyers are not good. Um, they have demonstrated an ability through a combination of financing, legal terms, contractual obligations, et cetera, that is very, very difficult once you have gotten in bed with China to separate yourself from China. And so I would expect that no matter who wins the election, the Chinese will maintain space relations and broader economic relations with Brazil. Uh, the, the extent may vary, but I don't think it is likely that whatever President Bolsonaro and he wins, uh, would want to do that he can divorce himself from China. Is there the prospect of a Latin American space agency? Possibly. I think there the issues are going to be much more, again, terrestrial. What are the relations like among the ABC countries, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and some of the other players? To what extent are they willing to cooperate with each other? Beijing is going to be happy to promote cooperation with each of these countries individually, as well as multilaterally. Uh, they have built uh, facilities in Argentina. I believe they've also built facilities in Chile. As I said, they have cooperation uh, with Brazil. And I think that what we have seen elsewhere is a Chinese willingness to provide funding, provide uh, construction uh, at, at uh, very, very good rates. Um, now, uh, somebody should probably go through all facilities with a set of uh, sniffer teams. Uh, because if you look at the uh, African Unity headquarters built in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, what they found was that the entire information system would download to an IP address in Shanghai uh, once, I think, at least once a week, possibly once every evening at about three in the morning when nobody was there. Um, they found this because they were monitoring the uh, power usage and they were noticing these weird spikes at three in the morning. And they went in and looked and literally all of the computers and things, which have been provided by Huawei, I believe, were literally downloading everything. Uh, emails, documents, uh, you know, exchanges, uh, agendas, drafts, uh, inter-office memos. Um, I'm sure the Chinese said it was uh, for cloud purposes. Uh, they certainly never owned up that it was espionage. Um, and it was so thorough going that the AU has no real choice because you'd have to tear down the building and start over. So, so the next question from uh, Clark Thomas. How has China's view of space dominance as connected integrally with information warfare affected U.S. space policy and strategy? So effect of China's perceptions right, of space dominance on us. And furthermore, what is your opinion on how the U.S. should adapt moving forward? Um, people often think that authoritarian systems can't innovate. Uh, Nazi Germany is a great counterexample, V2s, V1s, uh, things like that. 
here, I would note that China's PLA Strategic Support Force, which links its space, electronic warfare, and network warfare capabilities, has no counterpart anywhere. No one else created what is, I would submit, an information warfare force. And again, which, by the way, has a political warfare unit attached to it, specifically supposed to do the three warfares. Um, so sad to say, I would say that really hasn't affected us very much at all because we're not thinking that way. We have a standalone space force. We have a separate cyber command. Electronic warfare is the responsibility of each of the services. And I'm certainly not sure whether there's some kind of EW war plan connected or generated at the COCOM level. And it's also still not clear, I think, whether or not Space Force War, Space Command, actually, I'm sorry, Space Command, would ever be the supported command. Uh, whereas, one, I don't think the Chinese get into the supported, supporting command all that much. But more to the point is they view it as information warfare. So I think in this regard, the Chinese are ahead. I would like to see us think more about information dominance and integrating that. Um, we are different from the Chinese, so I would not ever want to see Cyber Command hacking a Chinese company to get their marketing plan. Um, we don't do that. Um, but we should be aware that we are going to, you know, Chinese economic activities often have strategic underlying concepts. Chinese military actions will include ability to mobilize corporate and commercial and civilian, and I use those terms distinct from each other, assets and capabilities. And information warfare is, because it is so important, will be conducted by all parts of their system. Expect Chinese ISPs, Chinese universities to hack other people. Expect Chinese civilian and scientific satellites to potentially be doing jamming or other activities in orbit. So, I'd like to see us think a little bit more like the Chinese than that. Next question is from Major Brian Green um, over at Starcom. Uh, he says, Mr. Chang, has China publicly responded to the US uh, and certain allies' pledges not to conduct destructive direct ascent anti satellite missile testing? Uh, if so, what have they said? Right. So, of course, a reference to Vice President Harris's uh, kind of unilateral uh, U.S. pronouncement that we will no longer conduct these tests, which has now been signed on to, I believe, by about six additional countries. I don't believe the Chinese have responded publicly, um, and I doubt that they are going to pay much attention to it. Uh, it is not a ban. It is said we are not going to test um, in a destructive manner. Uh, when you, you know, they had no comment at all about the Russians. Uh, when they tested, and that was a very destructive, very degree-generating event. Uh, they had lots of comments when the Indians did it. Uh, they started off by saying, see, the Indians are terrible. Uh, why aren't you condemning the Indians? And when uh, then NASA administrator... Um, Is it Mr. Bill Richardson? No. Sorry, no, not at the time. No, uh, previous. Uh, sorry. Uh, when he did condemn it, the funny thing was the Chinese then turned on a dime and said to the Indians, see, this shows you the Americans are, won't have your back. You conduct a test and the Americans condemn you and just, you know, and, and why are you letting them basically tell you what to do? So, uh, you know, never ever accepting that they had any responsibility at all. Uh, so no, I don't expect, now what I will note is the following. Uh, with the 20th Party Congress, what we have seen is Yang Wang Yi, the, uh, current state council for foreign affairs elevated to the Politburo. What that means is that once again, we're gonna have a foreign policy person on the Politburo, which in turn means that we will see better coordination of military and diplomatic and economic activities. In 2007, when the Chinese did their ASAT test that was destructive, the foreign policy establishment had no one on the Politburo. And that was one of the key reasons why the Chinese military, when they tested, didn't inform the Chinese foreign ministry. The Chinese foreign ministry had no relevance. You would not inform the Chinese foreign ministry of a missile test, an ASAT test, any more than you would inform the Chinese Environmental Protection Agency or the Chinese Agricultural Ministry. They're irrelevant. 
now that they are on the Politburo, they're relevant. So we should expect to see that the Chinese will coordinate their messaging. So there may be a response, um, but the fact that there wasn't one when Yang Jiechi was on the Politburo and he is of the foreign policy stature suggests that the Chinese are ignoring it. So our next question comes from uh, Professor Michelle Hanlon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. You talked about safety uh, and keep out zones in orbit. Do you have a sense of Chinese goals with respect to lunar activities? Will they support a safety zone concept with respect to uh, the UN Copious uh, Space Resources Working Group? Do they agree with the interpretation of Article 2 as permitting the extraction and use of space resources? Well, it's very clear from Chinese writings on cis lunar activities that they believe that. Uh, the exploitation of space resources is perfectly okay. Um, whether or not it is, can be done by private enterprise is less clear. Uh, we've, of course, passed laws that have said that we can. I don't believe the Chinese have commented very much on those. Um, the Chinese, of course, have the advantage that they can have state-owned enterprises do it. It's a government. Uh, war, private commercial enterprises do it. In some cases, they really are commercial. In other cases, they're not really commercial. Um, with regards to, to Kokuos, et cetera, do I think the Chinese are going to put missile bases on the moon? Probably not. Uh, do I think that the Chinese might, however, establish keep out zones, again, for safety, not sovereignty, on the moon, uh, particularly as they land uh, at the lunar uh, poles, uh, which does seem to be where uh, we think there will be the most water? Uh, yes, I think that the Chinese are likely to play that game. Um, and uh, one of the key things to keep in mind is if you ask permission from the Chinese to land near one of their sites, that's all they need because you have accepted that they have control of it. And this is one of the fascinating things. Again, the South China Sea offers, I would submit, near exact analogs and parallels. The Chinese have a problem with the Filipinos fishing near Scarborough Shoal. They have no problem with Filipinos fishing near Scarborough Shoal if they ask permission from the local Chinese government located at the Paracels. If you register and basically say, hi, where are the you know, Manila Six and we want to go and, and fish there, you're okay to fish. That's, it's not, we want you out of there. It's you have to come kiss the ring. And then when we have granted you permission because you've recognized that we're in control, you go ahead and fish. Not a problem. And I suspect that is going to be what will happen uh, in the quasi race for the polls. Excellent. Well, sir, a uh, follow up question on um, some of the stuff you were mentioning with respect to uh, Paros and uh, activities at the Conference on Disarmament and the like. Obviously, Russia, China, right, they put forth their draft uh, PPWT, uh, which you referenced, right, prohibiting placement of weapons in outer space. Talked a little bit about the interpretations and definitions contained in those. Could you speak to uh, China's perception and generally speaking, its negative perception of kind of the Western countries, right, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, their efforts at the United Nations with respect to, for instance, the uh, ongoing open-ended working group uh, with respect to responsible behavior in space, right, which was created on the basis of the UK's uh, kind of responsible norms of behavior sort of um, uh, resolutions at first the General Assembly, right, and then the first committee. Could you speak to China's perceptions on those things? Um I think that one of the real problems from Beijing's perspective, and here I'm not so sure that they're necessarily wrong, is terms like responsible behavior. Who determines what is responsible? And we, the UK, France, even to a certain extent Russia, come from a Western perspective, uh, minus Russia. Uh, we believe in the rule of law. We believe in a certain equality of states. Luxembourg has as big a voice in the EU and NATO as France, as the United States. Yang Jie at the 2009 ASEAN summit looked at Singapore when he said, there are big countries, there are small countries, and everyone knows the difference. That is, I mean, and he, he is a diplomat. He comes from the Chinese diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, this is their version of diplomacy. Is at the end of the day, China, across five thousand years of history, 
has a very different perspective on how countries are supposed to act and therefore what is responsible behavior. And again, it goes back to issues like rule by law. No, we are not equal. I am bigger than you, I'm more powerful than you, I'm frankly more meaningful than you, I'm certainly more civilized than you. You do not talk to me as though we are equal. And when you are a small country, and I hate to say this, but Great Britain is a small country, you certainly are not qualified to have me treat you as an equal. Now, I wanna be at the UN, diplomatic respect. I'm a member of the UN P5, it's very powerful. But all of these ideas and regulations and working groups and all of that, they're great bodies for me to exercise influence. They're great bodies for me to demonstrate that you are not supported by the global south, which I will wrangle together. But you are clearly trying to constrain my freedom of action. That's not how that works in the Chinese perspective. And I think that this party Congress is going to show, is, has going to lead to five more years of wolf warrior diplomacy, five more years of, they will attend these meetings, they will reject and rebut, but we're not going to see much progress in terms of any of these sorts of freedom and Absolutely. Well, sir, I don't believe any additional questions have uh, flowed into the chat box. Um, I will stall for a minute uh, to see if anyone has any additional questions. Uh, I do see that it is about uh, 0901, so we have reached our typical uh, hour length of time. Um, but uh, please go ahead. If anyone does have any final questions, go ahead and uh, throw those into the chat. Um, and as we stall, I will ask uh, you, Mr. Cheng, do you have any final comments or words uh, to leave our audience with today? Um, I do think that it is important to recognize that the Chinese effort to establish a dominating position in space, um, while we tend to focus on the military aspect, is a, like so much of their other foreign policy efforts, a whole of society effort, that discussions of space law um, and I uh, remember Professor, I think it was Brinovitz from the University of Mississippi going over there and teaching them about space. These sorts of things, they're, they're well and good and it's useful to expose them, but what we have seen is a China that rejects most of the underlying tenets and is very much interested, not so much in a legal regime as we understand it as legal warfare efforts. Um, and we need to recognize that in the event of a conflict, and discussions about Taiwan have been increasing over the last couple of years, and will continue to do so. In the event of a conflict, we will see an unfettered legal warfare effort across a range of bodies, not just in the United States, but the courts in Europe, courts in South America, elsewhere. Um, and we need to be prepared for that, um, because that is, is I mean, it would be ironic if societies built upon the rule of law were unprepared for legal warfare waged against them. Well, sir, thank you for that. Uh, no additional questions, uh, so we can go ahead and end here. But, sir, I just wanted to thank you for your time this morning. I know that there's a lot going on here at the Air Force Academy over the coming days with the Academy Assembly. Thank you so much for donating your time to us. Uh, and thank you for your words of wisdom to the audience on this incredibly important topic. My pleasure. So, thank you. Thank